Vladimir Putin is the richest Russian in the world with a net worth of $29 billion, according to Bloomberg Billionaires Index. He is best known to play ice hockey with Russian President Vladimir Putin on his $300 million luxury yacht. He served as Deputy Prime Minister of Russia under President Boris Yeltsin and has close relations with Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Potanin – How to Become Richest Russian Oligarch We at Business Chronicles tell the stories of extraordinarily successful people. Please subscribe to our channel to help us in making more videos. He is known as the mastermind behind the Loans for Shares program which laid the foundation of oligarchy. The Loans for Shares program created many oligarchs. People close to politicians were able to buy the country's natural resource companies for the price far below its market value. One such example is Roman Abramovich, who is the current owner of $3.2 billion Chelsea Football Club. He acquired 50% shares of Russian government-owned oil company Sibneft for $100 million. The original worth of the company was $1.2 billion. A few years later, Gazprom, another Russian state-owned company, acquired Sibneft for $13 billion. From the deal, Roman Abramovich got $10 billion. Before the deal, Abramovich already collected about $6 billion in Sibneft's dividends and stock sales, which makes the total profit of $16 billion. The Sibneft sell-off happened in 2005 and the deal made Abramovich the richest Russian. Another example is Vagid Alekperov, who currently owns around 30% stake in Lukoil, which is Russia's largest private oil and gas company. When Vagid Alekperov was Deputy Minister of the Oil and Gas Industry of Russia, he merged three state-owned oil companies into one which he named Lukoil. Lukoil was privatized and Vagid Alekperov became its president and chairman of the board. Vagid Alekperov slowly acquired stake in Lukoil using debt and later proceeds from dividends and asset sales. His stake in 2002 was 10%. In 2007, it was increased to 16.9% and today he owns 30% stake. Today, with the $21 billion net worth, he is one of the richest people in Russia. In 1995, Vladimir Potanin created Loans for Shares program, and he used the program to acquire state-owned Norilsk Nickel, which is the world's largest refined nickel producer, the 11th largest copper producer, and was making around $400 million profit at that time. Vladimir Potanin owned the bank which conducted the auctions of Norilsk Nickel. The bank rejected the rival offer of $335 million. Instead, his company paid $170 million to acquire 38% stake in Norilsk Nickel. In 1997, due to loan default by government, full control of the Norilsk Nickel was given to Potanin's company, making him the richest Russian. Want to know how Vladimir Potanin became the richest Russian? How he came up with the idea of Loans for Shares program, which helped him to create oligarchs we know? Watch the full video. In 1961, Vladimir Putanin was born in Moscow to a high-ranking communist family of diplomat and a doctor. His father worked in Ministry of Foreign Trade in the Soviet Union. In 1978, he got admission in Moscow State Institute of International Relations, which was an elite school that groomed students for the KGB and offices of the Kremlin. In 1983, he graduated with a degree in international economics and joined the Ministry of Foreign Trade of the Soviet Union and remained there for the next eight years. During his job at the Ministry of Foreign Trade, he spent time in foreign countries and became fluent in English and French. He made political connections that proved to be invaluable. He met with future Deputy Prime Minister of Russia Alexander Klaponin, who worked at Loan Department for Bank of Development and Foreign Economic Affairs. Alexander Klaponin introduced Potanin to his former classmate Mikhail Prokhorov, who was head of international finance at the International Bank for Economic Cooperation or IBEC, which was created to handle the foreign trade account of Soviet states. In 1990, Vladimir Potan informed Interos Foreign Trade Association and became president of the association. In 1992, Vladimir Potan and Mikhail Prokhorov, after the fall of the Soviet Union, formed Russia's first private banking institution, International Company for Finance and Investments or MFK. 
IBEC was in trouble as many of newly formed countries under fallen Soviet Union were not able to pay back their loans. Letters went out from IBEC's management to clients, suggesting that they shift their deposits to the new bank called MFK. Deposits of IBEC were taken away by MFK while leaving behind the debts. It is estimated MFK Bank made $300 million within six months. In 1993, Vladimir Potanin, together with Mikhail Prokhorov, formed United Export-Import Bank or Unexim Bank and became its president. Within two years, the bank had assets more than $2 billion. The bank continued to flourish till 2000 when it was merged with Rossbank. Private ownership was not allowed in the Soviet Union. It is estimated that there were 45,000 companies controlled by the state. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia started to transition from a state-controlled command economy to market-driven free economy. Mass privatizations and market reforms, particularly in the industrial, energy, and financial sectors, were done under Russian President Boris Yeltsin. Anatoly Chubayas was made responsible for the privatization in Russia. He studied several models in different countries, eventually he opted for voucher privatization program which was used by the Czech Republic. In this program, vouchers were distributed equally among the population, including minors. The majority of the population, due to financial illiteracy, sold these vouchers to the oligarchs at the price far below the market value, and these oligarchs eventually got the controlling stake in the companies. From 1992 to 1994, 15,000 state-owned companies were privatized through the voucher program. The oligarchs are the product of the privatization of state-owned companies after the fall of the Soviet Union. Some of them were formed due to voucher privatization programs, while many of them were formed due to loans for shares program. In this program, Russian banks gave loans to the government, and in return they got stakes in state-owned companies as collateral. Within a few years, the government defaulted and the collateral stake in state-owned companies were permanently transferred to the owners of banks. In 1995, Vladimir Potanin suggested the Loans for Shares program to Anatoly Chibayas, who was Deputy Prime Minister of Russia and was responsible for the privatization in Russia. The program was administered through auctions and many of auctions were handled by Potanin's Unexim Bank. Foreign bidders were usually not invited and only a few hand-picked bidders were invited. The banks who administered the auctions usually ended up winning them, usually at only a fraction over the minimum bid. The majority of Vladimir Putanin's wealth came from his stake in Norilsk Nickel, which is the world's largest producer of high-grade nickel. In 1995, the auction of Norilsk Nickel was organized by Putanin's Unexum Bank. His company Interos got 38% stake in Norilsk Nickel as collateral for $170 million. The rival bid of $355 million by Rosiki Credit Bank was rejected. In 1997, due to loan default by government, full control of Norilsk Nickel was given to Interos. Norilsk Nickel was making $400 million profit per year that time and getting controlling stake in it for $170 million looked like not a bad deal. In 1996, Vladimir Putanin was one of the few oligarchs who funded Boris Yeltsin's re-election campaign. Once Yeltsin was re-elected president, due to Putanin's contributions in privatization of Russian companies and his role in Loan for Shares program, he was made Deputy Prime Minister of the Russian Federation and was in charge of energy and economy. He left the position within a year. Vladimir Putanin's long-term partner was Mikhail Prokhorov, who owned 50% stake in Interos. Mikhail Prokhorov has a net worth of $13.9 billion. He once owned $3.2 billion NBA team Brooklyn Nets and financed $700 million to build its home arena, Barclays Center. He sold the basketball team for $2.35 billion to co-founder of Alibaba Group Joe Tsai, which is the highest price ever paid to an NBA team. In a separate deal, he sold Barclays Center for $1 billion to Joe Tsai. The deal is estimated to bring $2 billion profit for Mikhail Prokhorov, who invested less than $500 million. In 2001, Mikhail Prokhorov was made CEO of Norilsk Nickel. He proved to be a brilliant CEO and under him, the stock of Norilsk Nickel rose from $7 to $189 
which is a 2,700% increment in less than six years. The market cap of the company was $2.5 billion in 2001. After six years, it was more than $60 billion. In 2007, Mikhail Prokhorov was arrested in France. The arrest caused widespread media attention which Putanin did not like, and the putanin prokhorov partnership started to crack. They both came with arrangement where they decided to part ways and divide their combined assets. The biggest asset of Interos was Norilsk Nickel, of which Putanin had 30% stake, while Prokhorov had 25% stake. Prokhorov offered $15 billion to Putanin for his 30% stake, which he refused. In 2008, after President Putin's involvement, Prokhorov decided to quit the Norilsk Nickel and his shares were sold to Oleg Deripaska's UC Rusal for $14 billion. $7 billion was paid in cash and 14% stake in UC Rusal was given. Among other assets, Potanin and Prokhorov together owned holding company KM Invest, which had stakes valued at $11 billion in dozens of companies including Norilsk Nickel, Polyus Gold, Rossbank, Rosa Kutor, Soglisi Insurance, Prof Media, Open Investments, and many other companies. Vladimir Putanin bought Prokhorov's 50% stake in KM Invest for $3.8 billion. The disagreement and division of assets proved to be fruitful for Mikhail Prokhorov, as after three months of assets of liquidation, the world saw a global recession, and companies like Norilsk Nickel suffered a lot. Even today, 25% stake in Norilsk Nickel is worth less than $10 billion, which Prokhorov 14 years ago sold for $14 billion. Once Oleg Deripaska had 25% stake in Norilsk Nickel, he slowly started to accumulate more stakes, which caused the ownership conflict between Deripaska and Potanin. In 2012, the Kremlin stepped in to resolve the four-year conflict between Putanin and Deripaska. Roman Abramovich was brought in to settle things and at the end of it was decided that he will acquire 6.5% stake in Norilsk Nickel. Under the deal, Vladimir Putanin was made CEO and both Putanin and Deripaska were barred from selling or buying the stakes in Norilsk Nickel. During his tenure as CEO, he invested billions to improve the environment issues caused by Norilsk Nickel. He had promised to invest over $17 billion to reduce the pollution by modernizing the company equipment and operations. The company plans to reduce its emission by 75% till 2023. In 2017 alone, the company reduced its emissions by 35%. In 2021, Norilsk Nickel was fined $2 billion for a huge oil spill in the Arctic. According to the company, the estimated damages should only be $300 million. In 2014, the Winter Olympics were held in Sochi, which is a Russian city. And due to being a warm and subtropical resort, it is popular for water sports and beaches. It is estimated that Russia managed to spend $51 billion on construction of hotels, skating rinks, and ski jumps, with over 100,000 workforce working day and night. It was eight times more expensive than previous Winter Olympics, which was hosted in Vancouver. It even surpassed the summer events in Athens, whose budget was $15 billion, London, whose budget was $14 billion, and even Beijing, whose budget was a gigantic $40 billion. Sochi Olympics was the most expensive games ever. Vladimir Putanin was the largest private investor of the games. Vladimir Putanin was the one who lobbied having the Olympics in Sochi. He invested $30 million on just lobbying efforts. He initially intended to invest $300 million on a modest ski resort in Sochi. But when in 2007 it was announced that the 2014 Winter Olympics will be held in Sochi, he invested over $2.5 billion on his Olympic dream. He did not get much return on investment, especially the ski resort. Perhaps all the investment was done to accomplish his dream, as once he said, We were skiing with President Putin in Austria, and there was talk that it would be good to have such resorts in Russia. It's more a question of legacy. Vladimir Putanin's partner in Norilsk Nickel, Oleg Deripaska, also invested $1.38 billion on Sochi Olympics. His companies refurbished the city's airport, built the main Olympic village, and constructed the Amerotinsky freight port. Like all other oligarchs, Vladimir Putanin also has a long track record of philanthropic work. 
In 1999, he created a non-profit charitable organization called Vladimir Potanin Foundation. In 2003, he became member of the board of trustees of Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation, which is a leading institution for the collection, preservation, and research of modern and contemporary art, and operates several museums around the world. In 2022, due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, he resigned from the board. The statement coming from the board was, the Guggenheim strongly condemns the Russian invasion and unprovoked war against the government and people of Ukraine. In 2006, he became member of the Board of Trustees of Moscow State Institute of International Relations and has donated around $6.5 million to its endowment fund. In 2010, he announced that he would donate most of his fortune to charity instead of giving it to his three children. As he said, there won't be an inheritance of my fortune. My capital should work for the good of society and continue working for these social aims. In 2013, he was the first Russian to sign the Giving Pledge, which was formed by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Signatories of the pledge vow to donate most of their wealth to charity. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine, many oligarchs have been sanctioned by US, UK, and the EU. Roman Abramovich was the most high-profile name that was sanctioned by the UK government. He is not allowed to move out of the country and his assets are frozen. Also, he is not allowed to sell Chelsea Football Club. Oleg Deripaska was also sanctioned by the UK. He owns multiple properties worth millions of pounds in the UK which are frozen. Vladimir Putin is considered close to President Putin, but despite his close ties, he is not sanctioned by the US, UK or EU. Like all other oligarchs, Putanin is also a fan of keeping expensive luxury yachts. He currently owns a mega yacht called Nirvana. He spent $300 million for the construction of the 290-foot yacht. It cost around $30 million per year just to run the maintenance of the yacht. The yacht comes with a swimming pool that can convert into a dance floor, helicopter pad, on-deck jacuzzi, massage room, steam room, sauna, and gym facilities. This is the same yacht where Vladimir Putin used to play ice hockey with President Putin. Another 248-foot luxury yacht he owned was Anastasia. He sold the yacht for 75 million euro in 2018. Putana named the yacht after his daughter Anastasia. He also owns another 290-foot luxury yacht, Barbara. Once he briefly listed the yacht on the market for 165 million euro. All three yachts are constructed by yacht builder Ocean Co. in the Netherlands and interior styling is done by Australian designer Sam Sergiovanni. Vladimir Putin's family connections and his foreign exposure enabled him to see things beyond what other Russians could see. It is said that there is always an opportunity in every crisis. He used the crisis of Soviet Union dissolution and partnered with another future oligarch Mikhail Prokhorov to acquire deposits of fallen Soviet state-owned banks. Then he created the Loan for Shares program which not only made him the richest Russian till now, but also created the foundation for oligarchy. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this.